Thanks so much, Bob. And I have so many friends in this audience, so get your questions ready, okay? I only talk for about probably 20 minutes, and then there should be plenty of time. And um, Bob, I hadn't remembered that Lawrence Lyric Opera Guild evening. That was really something. Wow, well, yeah. Um, that was when the Kansas City Lyric Opera produced world, a world premiere opera about John Brown that I got to be a consultant for, and then got to talk a little bit about it to the very active Lawrence <laughs> Opera Group. Um, and also this summer, that was a tough one. Um, the city fathers asked me if I would talk at that that uh, big get together in South Park in August, and at first I was really quite nervous and concerned about that because I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense to commemorate the worst day in your town's history. Um, a lot of people would forget, prefer to forget that kind of thing. Um, what was so great about it, and Bob I know was there because he plays clarinet in the Lawrence City Band, is in a very Lawrence way, we, we marked this horrible, horrible event, and we kind of thrived in moving beyond it. And that's one of the things that makes Lawrence, to me, so special. Um, and I'll talk about that today. That's actually the topic of what I'm going to talk about. But I'm going to back into it um, by talking a little bit about, about the Civil War on the border of Kansas and Missouri, which is the topic of a book that my colleague Diane Mudie Burke and I co-edited the University Press of Kansas published pretty much in, in exact time for that 150th anniversary. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the essays in this book, but I'm going to talk about really two different cities. And I think I see Paul here. Paul heard me talk about this a little bit at a, at a political meeting in August, but I'm, going to, I'm still really interested in some of the things I kind of thought up on the spur of the moment there, and we'll try to talk through some of them there. All right, I'm going to start with a slide of Forest Hill Cemetery. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this. Oops. There we go. Anyone ever been to Forest Hill in Kansas City? It's okay. It's right. It's right. Right where the Battle of Westport was fought. It's a it's a sprawling necropolis located uh, in KC Mo, less than two miles from the Kansas state line. It's a border today that is almost meaningless. You know, we we cross State Line Road, you know, without even thinking of it. Uh, the houses look pretty much the same on both sides of the line. Okay, our legislature might be a little crazier than theirs, but not much. Everyone's kind of equally crazy. Um, the point I want to make is that 150 years ago, the Kansas-Missouri line formed a porous and portentous boundary between slavery and freedom, North and South, Union and Confederate. They're a short walk from the graves of notable Kansas Cityans, including Kansas City's Jazz Age Mayor Tom Prendergast and Negro League's baseball great Satchel Paige is an impressive monument that I took a picture of here. Uh, it's a monument to fallen Confederate soldiers from the Battle of Westport fought on those very grounds. It's a Civil War battle often called the Gettysburg of the West, the largest military engagement on our side, the western side of the Mississippi. Um, if you can imagine, 30,000 men were engaged in this battle on October 23rd of 1864. Uh, military historians would tell you, this is not my specialty, that it represented a turning point of the Confederate General Sterling Price's Missouri Expedition. Um, I have another picture of that. Uh, th this dramatic but ill-conceived raid, this one? Perfect. I have a picture of it. This dramatic but ill-conceived raid uh, by Confederate cavalry through the Missouri Eastern Kansas region in 1864 proved to be the war's last significant southern expedition west of the Mississippi. After this, Union Army controlled most of it. Its failure helped re-elect Abraham Lincoln as a political historian. That's significant for me. He, Lincoln really thought he was done in August of, of 1864, and certain things that happened over the course of that fall um, really did ensure that he would win re-election. Probably the most important thing that ensured Lincoln's re-election was the decision to allow the Union troops to vote and count their votes back in their home <coughs> districts. That was something that really mattered. A lot of the soldiers decided that that day of voting to continue to fight, continue until the Confederacy had surrendered unconditionally. And Price's raid was painted, in this case by Samuel Reeder, a quartermaster in the 2nd Kansas State Militia, who was one of the Union prisoners captured on October 22nd following a little skirmish called the Battle of the Blue. And that's actually what he's painted here. 
in this beautiful piece of folk art. I'm delighted that this piece uh, of art now graces the cover of the new book. I don't think it was ever published before. It was only found a few years ago in the Kansas State Historical Society, and now it's on their website at my insistence. I think they call it Cool Things. But you can see the drama that was the Civil War here, and how it wasn't two lines of some guys in gray, some guys in blue, um, firing at each other across a, a field. It, was, you know, it, it involved burning haystacks, people's homes, people being captured. But here, let me get back to the point about Forest Hill. Although there are Union dead buried at Forest Hill Cemetery, you'd never be able to find their markers, I would venture. This is because sites like Forest Hill and another one, the Confederate Memorial Site in Higginsville, Missouri. Anybody been there? Okay, a couple of you been there. Um, Higginsville, Missouri is um, an hour east of Kansas City, and this is a cemetery that is 100% dedicated to the lost cause of the Confederate States of America. And indeed, the markers at Forest Hill are dedicated largely to telling the story of the Confederate Joe Shelby's last stand um, that allowed General Price's army to escape the battlefield. Um, General Shelby himself also retreated that October day. I didn't learn this until I researched my book. And when the Confederacy began to topple, he buried his battle flags in the Rio Grande, and with 700 fellow militants entered Mexico to plant what was called a gringo colony named Carlotta near Veracruz. And after the dismal failure of this enterprise, they're almost always dismal failures, uh, Shelby settled back here in rural Bates County, Missouri. And shortly before his death in 1898, he lived to a ripe old age, General Shelby apologized for his role in the border conflict here on the Kansas-Missouri line, uh, saying, quote, I went there to kill free state men. I did kill them. I am now ashamed of myself for having done so. But then times were different from what they are now. Pretty interesting thing to say for an old soldier. Shelby's final resting place is a stone's throw from the towering monument, monument to the Old South at Forest Hill. Now, since I've talked about a big gravesite in Kansas City, Missouri, let's talk about our own answer for that. It's a, it's a more modest site. It's the Quantrill Monument in Oak Hill Cemetery. Who's been there? Okay, more of us. Good. I actually find it a very peaceful and lovely place to visit. Um, Oak Hill Cemetery is closer to the west of Kansas City than Higginsville, that Confederate site, is to the east. This monument was erected in 1886, and according to the front of the marker, is, quote, dedicated to the memory of the 150 citizens who, defenseless, fell victims to the inhuman ferocity of the border guerrillas led by the infamous Quantrell, they misspelled it, um, in his raid upon Lawrence, August 21st, 1863. So just as Missouri lost causers continued to celebrate the Confederacy in what was, of course, a border state that never left the Union, I keep having to remind my friends in Missouri who flaunt the Confederate battle flag that Missouri never did join those 11 states that seceded in 1861. Um, I guess I'm lucky I still have all my teeth since I remember <laughs> of that court fairly frequently. But again, it doesn't make a lot of sense for the, this neo-Confederate world to be centered in many ways in Higginsville, Missouri. Anyway, the citizens of Lawrence similarly refused to forget the raid by Confederate guerrillas led by Quantrill who massacred a lion's share of our town's male population on that horrible August morning. Um, I would say the number is closer to 200 than the, the 150 number mentioned on the marker. These memories preserved in stone, both in Missouri and Kansas, and Missourians and Kansans' post-war interpretations of the history of the Civil War on the border is the topic of this new book that um, I have published in the last year. And I actually, I'm not sure if commerce is allowed at the University Forum, but if anyone wants to see a copy of the book, you can have a look at it. It is for sale for I would say 1995, which is the list price, but I didn't bring any nickels, so I'd be willing to part with it for 19 or 20 dollars if you wanted to buy one. Um, perhaps it's understandable that emotions were still raw in the years directly after the Civil War, but it's more difficult to comprehend, at least for me, how such a simple view of the conflict that I hear so often, that all white Missourians supported slavery in the Confederacy, and all white Kansans were freedom-loving abolitionists who were victimized by Confederate guerrillas, to some degree persists 150 years later. This is what I hear when I listen to the bar fights and the conversations between Missourians and Kansans. 
um, missing from this memory, I think, is the complex story of the earlier history of the two states and the violent conflict that erupted along the political line that divided them. Indeed, the experiences of Missouri and Kansas residents during the era of the border wars, which my co-author and I define as between 1854 and really the 1880s, the Civil War went a long way and went on for a long time here, is a window on the issues and circumstances that shattered the Union during this period. After all, it was on the Kansas-Missouri border that Americans first grappled with the problem of liberty and slavery face to face. Those of you who've been to the battlefield down in Blackjack in southern Douglas County can read there that that's one of the first places, maybe the first place, where pro-slavery guys and anti-slavery guys shot each other in a, in a battle. Um, so some people definitely shed blood in interest of their cause before Fort Sumter, before the Civil War began. So what was it that made the Civil War, including its prelude, in bleeding Kansas and its long postbellum memory so unique on our border with Missouri. Why did it become, in the words of my friend, the late historian Michael Fellman, who writes the introduction to my book, um, no, it's actually the first chapter, I, I think I wrote the introduction. Uh, he called it the worst guerrilla war in American history, and I think he's right. After all, the men and women on both sides of the border spoke the same language, they worshiped the same God, they lived under the same flag, for almost a hundred years. Here the war in the West became an endless cycle of robbery, arson, torture, murder, mutilation, and endless cycle of revenge and revenge and revenge, as Michael Fellman wrote. While using the most brutal and ruthless physical means, men and women victimized one another, lied, dehumanized their enemies, lost all empathy, and retreated into numbness and buried their consciences behind a high, hard wall of utter antipathy. This is why I love Michael as a historian. That's beautiful writing. Indeed, the war on the border became a true bellum omnium contra omnis, a war of all against all, here on the Kansas-Missouri border, using Thomas Hobbes's memorable phrase from Leviathan. Could a society so fragmented by ideology and violent conflict ultimately reconcile and rebuild on different lines? I think right now we can look back and say, of course. I go shopping at the plaza, I go see the Royals play at Kaufman Stadium, I don't really think about it. But for many Kansans, many Missourians for many years, this was a rough thing to imagine doing. And it wasn't easy to get where we are today. <clears throat> and the struggle goes on. Let me try to illustrate this point by talking about two, what we would now call Midwestern towns, 131 miles apart. Um, let me start with Osceola, Missouri, a town of 900, located on the Osage River in western Missouri's county of St. Clair. The other town I want to talk about is where most of us live, where we are right now. Lawrence, Kansas, a town of about 90 or 95,000 people, so 10 times, 100 times as large, uh, located on the Kansas River in eastern Kansas in the county of Douglas. Osceola on one hand, Lawrence on the other. Anybody here know what they have in common? Yeah? They both had a raid. They were both attacked, raided, sacked during the Civil War. Excellent. You guys are good. Um, another thing I found just by looking up in the records was the town's population at the time. Both had approximately 2,000 residents at the beginning of the Civil War. So there are far more similarities than differences between Osceola, Missouri, and Lawrence, Kansas, as Lincoln was inaugurated in Washington City in March of 1861. Um, just five months after Lincoln was inaugurated, in September of that year, Jayhawkers, led by Lawrence's own Jim Lane, sacked the town of Osceola, as we just heard, burning many buildings, looting its courthouse, um, stealing lots of provisions, and many of these provisions were supposedly returned to Lawrence. Um, guns, money from the banks, records from the courthouse, Movie buffs among us might note that this is the event that inspired the 1976 Clint Eastwood film, The Outlaw Josie Wales. I love this movie. Um, I'm sorry to say I love it because I'm kind of on the other side, but um, boy, I do love me, love me some Clint Eastwood. Um, again, prior to the attack on Osceola, the, the town had a population of 2,000, more maybe like 2,200, but less than 200 residents remained after Jim Lane left town. Uh, not because of mass slaughter, that happened here, 
but because people just decided to up and leave. They gave up. And the population has never again approached its antebellum numbers. In September 2011, you might remember if you read the journal World, lingering bad feelings about the Osceola raid and the, the sesquicentennial of the event prompted the August Osceola Board of Aldermen to pass a resolution asking the University of Kansas to kindly no longer use the, the Jayhawk as their mascot and its nickname. These people held a grudge. Further, the resolution asked Missouri residents to stop spelling Kansas or KU with a capital letter because, and I quote, neither is a proper name or a proper place. <laughs> Ouch. I guess they're not rooting for us in the tournament in Osceola. Um, we all know what happened here in Lawrence two years later. We've already discussed it a little bit. When a former school teacher from the free state of Ohio, ironically, led a band of 450 Missouri-based bushwhackers to Lawrence. Um, bushwhacker, I should mention, I got a picture of the rape. Oh, here's a, a map from my book. You can see Osceola right here, just basically just east of Fort Scott. And of course, Lawrence, we're right here. So Battle of Westport, where I, talk, where I started this lecture, was up here. And maybe I'll talk about Lexington, just up the Missouri River, in a few minutes, if we have time. But this is my favorite illustration of Quantrill's Raid, because it's actually um, painted by someone who claimed to have been in town that day. So at least an eyewitness account. Uh, we all know that Quantrill led a band of 450 uh, <coughs> guerrillas here. Um, that they were called Bushwhackers. Bushwhackers is kind of the equivalent name for Missourians that we have for Jayhawkers, or Jayhawks, um, soldiers who were guerrillas but still fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War. Um, and of course, on that horrible morning, Quantrill and his men cut a vicious, pitiless, and horrific swath through our town. Um, again, 200 men and boys killed one day, and fully one quarter of the town's structures were reduced to smoldering ruins, as evinced by this drawing. Lawrence represented everything Quantrill and his lieutenants, including Bloody Bill Anderson, Frank James, and Cole Younger, everything they feared and loathed. Of course, the town was known far and wide as a bastion of <coughs> anti-slavery ideas. Uh, some of its nicknames at the time were the Freedom City or New Boston. And also, of course, it was the home of Jim Lane, who was, in fact, quite ruthless during the Civil War, and ruthless toward certainly the people of Osceola. A secret Union military society known as the Red Legs were headquartered in Lawrence, just off Mass Street. And Lawrence happened to be, by 1863, a prosperous community with scores of well-built homes, banks, successful businesses ripe for plundering. And remember, Jim Lane did plunder when he went to Osceola. He didn't kill everybody, but he did plunder. And plundered, we were right back. And yet here's the difference. And I hope I'm not going to offend anybody if you're here from Osceola or from Western Missouri. The very day after the Lawrence Massacre, our forebears began to rebuild. They did not leave. Um, as many of you heard me say, if you heard me talk in South Park in August, Lawrence's worst day was immediately followed by some of its best days. Because the, men, the women and men, and they were mostly women, the, the guys were dead, um, who survived this hateful raid came together determined to rebuild, not just to survive, but to thrive. And I think thrive is what Lawrence has done with some peaks and valleys since then. It's why we are a thriving Midwestern college town um, full of people who, who move here from across the state, across the region, across the country, and Osceola, well, isn't. Um, these differences over slavery, over government power, over heritage, I hear that word a lot, persisted well into the 20th century. The men who perpetrated Mass Lawrence, um, I didn't know until I invited my colleague from Missouri State University, Jeremy Neely, uh, were feted annually in annual reunions. I have a picture of this. It's in the book, too. This is a reunion in 1906, not far from where the Chiefs play football today, of the Veterans of Quantrill's Raid on Lawrence. Um, well in the 1920s, these events took place. One of the things that I was kind of blown away, if you look at the, the top row, actually the row just ahead of the ladies in the back, there's an African-American man on the far right who was uh, an enslaved African-American who um, did come to town in 1863 and continued to 
go to these reunions. Um, I wish he was here so I could ask him a lot of questions about that. <laughs> um, I mentioned the town of Lexington, Missouri. A newspaper published for years in Lexington after the Civil War was called, I'm not joking, the Weekly Caucasian. So Missouri is kind of becoming more and more of a Confederate lost cause memory state, and Kansas is going to go the other way. Because as for us, um, we have this great reputation as the Civil War ends. Uh, we are a place where John Brown uh, came and rode and, and fought and killed to try to make Kansas territory a free state. Um, we're, a we're a state that had the first integrated, not integrated, but first colored troops fighting in the Civil War. Um, we have this great reputation. And after the Civil War, Kansas, for a lot of reasons we can talk about if you like, decided that they were going to coast on its progressive, uncorruptible Republican reputation from Civil War days. Um, I think they deserve this reputation less and less as the 1860s became the 1870s and 1880s and early 20th century as well. A sort of racial self-righteousness set in. We're, we were so good and pure and not really thinking about how things were for African Americans or other minority groups in the time they set in. Um, hoping to arrive in the land of John Brown, African Americans who called themselves exodusters poured out of states like Kentucky and Tennessee following a preacher named Benjamin Papp Singleton in an exodus to move to Kansas. But no one wanted them. Uh, city fathers in in Lawrence, in Tecumseh, in Topeka, said, move on. Um, the reasons they gave were actually not terrible reasons. They said, you're poor, we don't have any you know, relief to give you, you're sick, we don't have any medicine to give you. Um, move on, if you wouldn't mind. So uh, these are the people who founded some of the all-black towns in Kansas, like Nicodemus um, in north-central Kansas. Um, people who uh, really suffered when railroads decided to bypass their town, when lynchings occurred at truly frightening rates in the late 19th century, when segregation was imposed here in Kansas just as it was in the states of the South and in Washington, D.C. Uh, a chapter in my edited collection by a former KU master's student named Brent Campney talks about the lynchings that went on here in Kansas. Um, and he has a quote from 1911 from the Bell Plain News where the editor wrote, the man may come clear but he will find it little different if he is a black man than in Alabama and may wait till he gets out of Kansas before being so hasty again. So African Americans who flocked here after the Civil War started saying, well, maybe Kansas is not such a great place to go to. And African American migration turns toward urban northern cities like Chicago, places out west like Oakland. But to get back to my earlier question, how do our states, Missouri, Kansas, Warren, really on different sides of the Civil War in many ways, reconcile? My answer, as incomplete as it is, is that only when Missourians and Kansas eventually embrace